Remember, kids, always support your local furrycon. And, and, and also remember to always support your favorite furry YouTuber. Ruff, ruff, ruff. Hey guys, it's your Bo, your favorite furry YouTuber, and welcome back to Ad Astra, episode 22. Just like last episode, we left on a cliffhanger. Uh, Amicus is holding the human in his arms, and uh, the parents are speaking through the human, and the parents told Amicus that he has a choice to make. So that's where we're gonna continue right now. So let's go. But what does this have to do with Bo? Amicus shifts his hold on the human, just wanting him to come back to consciousness. He must play a role, and you must make a decision, Amicus. Everything seems to come together all at once for Amicus. All this talk of Drusus, and of his and Bo's apparently fixed destinies. That decision the wolves fawned over for generations, no matter what opinion they held about Drusus himself. The choice offered by the parents, to either save his empire, or save his lover. Icy, cold fear and dread blooms in the pit of Amicus' stomach and slowly spreads throughout the rest of his body, seeming to leak like a frigid liquid down his groin and to his legs. The wolf feels his limbs tremble as he pulls the human closer to his chest, lips drawn back as instincts kick in to protect his mate. For a long while, a length of time that's hard to discern, the wolf simply stares into the abyss. He looks up into the swirling stars, clouds and planets, trying to see, trying to see these things that are controlling and manipulating him and his lover. Trembling, Amicus shakes his head, taking another step back, away, even though the presence of the parents is all-encompassing. <laughs> no! Amicus' jaw clenches, hating himself for sounding so weak and afraid. Remembering who he is, the wolf squares his shoulders, glaring up into space. No! I won't make such a decision! For once, the unseen place in which the parents reside is silence, but clearly observant. Amicus can feel the prickle of their all-seeing eyes on the nape of his neck. I, you, you hear me? I won't do this! I, I'll, I'll stay here forever if I have to! You can't involve us in this foolishness! Bo suddenly shifts in his grasp, his head turning awkwardly, leaning up in a strange way that seems unnatural, as if pulled by strings. Amicus flinches back feeling a chill run up his spine as he tries to stop himself from dropping the human he knows so well. Foolishness? Bo stares at him with an expression that Amicus has never seen him make before. It's cold and almost dismissive, an expression Amicus has never seen him make before. How does this situation, in which the lives of a trillion sapiens teeter on the brink of annihilation, call for such childish statements, tell us in what universe would attempt to avoid such catastrophic outcome be considered foolishness? The Juma suddenly tilts his head in an unnatural way, leaning in closer to the wolf and Amicus gasps, setting a large paw against Bo's face, trying to stop the strange inhuman movements. Stop that! Don't hurt him! The Juman holds the position for a moment, then seems to slowly relax back into the wolf's arms. Amicus feels his heart pounding in his chest. He'd provoked, well, not even angered the parents, maybe just annoyance, but the experience had been terrifying. Seeing Bo twist and contort in such a way was unnerving, sure, and the wolf is beginning to realize why they are using Bo as a puppet. Anger and fear a battle for control over the wolf, before the latter finally wins out, remembering what type of decision he might have to make. Please, there must be another way, I, I can't, I can't choose between these two things. There's a pause in the air, and Amicus feels his knees about to give out, preparing to throw himself at the imaginary feet of these monolithic beings. He'd beg until end of time, wolf and pride be damned! What decision do you speak of? Amicus glares up at the stars. The... the decision presented to Drusus. The one decided for him by Mira ten millennia ago. Amicus frowns, knowing that the parents already know what he's talking about, becoming further distressed that they're making him vocalize things that are so obvious. Oh, Amicus, don't you know the proclivity of your own people to twist and distort, to aggrandize and romanticize the truth? Amicus is quiet, waiting, heart still hammering, simply feeling numb at this point. Do not rely on Wolven myth to inform you of parental intention. Only we will speak the truth to you. Amicus lets out a little growl, 
anger overcoming fear again. Uh, then what is it? Why torment me like this? Several moments of silence pass, and Amicus grows again, frustrated at the way he's being treated, how his emotions are being manipulated and sculpted like mounds of clay. This isn't what he had been taught at all. Had his father known the parents to be like this? His grandfather? Amicus wishes that he had been warmed somehow. As the silence drags on, the wolf tries to deaden his emotions, to not give these entities any sort of hint what he might be feeling, wanting to refuse his blatant attack on his own agency. Despite how futile he knows that must be. You can bring back your lover. At this very moment, time stands nearly still on your plane. Both body and mind are still savageable. Amicus' heart feels as though it might leave from his mouth, his hold on bow tightening. How? But only if you submit yourself to the benevolent will of the parents. Will you? Amicus furrows his brows in confusion, unsure of what this all could mean. But... I I've already done so. Ever since I was a pup, I've been told to... After this experience, your mind will waver. You are unsure as what our intentions truly are. There will be moments in which you will want to question, to doubt our will. You must overcome such moments. Our will is what is best for the galaxies and the universe as a whole. Amicus stares for a moment. And if I don't agree? Then we shall let the human pass on as it naturally should, and we shall wait for a future emperor to take your place. Amicus shakes his head, not wanting to believe that this is true, that this is the way that leaders of galaxies function. It must be done. The wolf is quiet, for once wishing that he isn't in such a position, wishing that he could hide away in the quiet countryside with his human to live a normal life. That is not your calling. It never was. I know. Amicus whispers, more to himself than to the parents. There's a long moment of silence in which Amicus simply stares into space, contemplating what it means to give up any true freedom, to submit himself to the absolute authority of the galaxy. Will you submit? Amicus takes a deep breath. Will... Uh, will my decision affect Bo's free will? You said you had plans for him as well. He will be allowed to make his own decisions. We will tell you of his mission once you make your decision. Amicus stifles another growl, hating that his human is being forced into this as well. Will you submit? Amicus closes his eyes, feeling his anger and resilience slowly drain away. Then he opens them. I submit. Blue light swirls in from my eyes in intricate spiraling tendrils. It's beautiful, and as I begin to focus, I see a blurry, grey shape in the middle of it. Even before I'm fully able to see him, I know it's my wolf. I smile and reach up, cupping the warm furry form. At some point along this little journey, I've stopped caring about whether the things I see are real or not. I'm just happy that I'm seeing him. He smiles down at me. Hey! I lie quietly in his arm for a moment, just enjoying the comforting blue glow. I'm reminded of when I first met Amicus, when our ship stalled into the blue dust cloud, when he finally revealed to me his botched plan. That feeling is so distant now, like it was years ago rather than just months. I take a deep breath, and something about it feels strange, almost like something mechanical is moving in my neck. I reach up, touching my fingers to my throat, and for a moment they brush against something that feels like a thin line of flesh. But Amicus reaches down to move my hand away, pressing it to my chest instead. You're alright. You're gonna be fine now. What? Then I also realize that my voice sounds strange. It still sounds like me, but there's something slightly off about it. Like it's a little higher and maybe even just a little robotic. I frown. Amicus presses against my chest firmly, comfortingly. Hey, it's okay. I know you might feel a bit strange, but you won't even notice it after a few days. What is he talking about? Again, I lay quietly in his arms as I gather my thoughts. The fight, the dagger, 
the darkness, the parents. Then I look up at Amicus in question. What? What happened? I try to ignore the strange soundless mechanical clicking feeling in my throat while also trying to get used to my new voice. It's like hearing myself in a recording. It's just not quite right. Amicus chuckles, sounding exhausted, relieved, and maybe a little sad at the same time. <laughs> oh, quite a bit happened, Bo. But the parents! I thought they wanted us to meet them! Amicus' gentle smile waves for a moment. Well, uh, they did. I met them. What? I don't remember... I racked my memory, but nothing comes to mind. You... You lost consciousness when it happened. I frown at that, wondering why that would happen, but Amicus doesn't offer an explanation. I look down at my chest, and instead of the coating of blood I expect to see, I'm clean and bare, aside from a few small wet spots on my chest. I suppose Amicus has been a little more emotional before I've woken up. I look back up at him, then press my face against his body, and he responds by hugging me close to his chest for a moment. So, is it over? They decided to bring me back? My voice is muffled against his fur. My strange, not quite right voice. Amicus loosens his hold on me, allowing me to look back up at his face. Yes, it's over. The tension that be held up in my chest ever since I arrived, ever since being abducted from my bedroom in Italy, it all releases slowly. For once, I feel light and free and I swag in the wolf's arms, sighing deeply. Even now, I'm starting to get used to the new feeling in my throat. I love you. I love you too. I smile up at him, and despite everything being over, I can't help but notice that he seems a bit sad too. I rest a hand against his chest. You alright? Amicus laughs loudly, shaking my entire body. <laughs> Aside from nearly losing everything I hold dear, <laughs> I suppose I'm alright, yes. I try to sit up, but Amicus keeps me reclined gently, but firmly. Are you sure? You seem upset. The big wolf sighs deeply, and I feel his torso puff out against my side and shoulder. There are... things that I must tell you, but later. It's not important right now. That tension that had been so mercifully loosened in my chest suddenly appears again, albeit in a much smaller way. I want to ask more, but for now, I just want to rest. Well, as long as I'm not gonna pass out and wake up completely confused again, <laughs> I feel like that's all I've been doing the past month. Amicus huffs in amusement. <laughs> yes, you do have a knack for such things. We go quiet again. And it's a nice kind of quiet. We're both just basking in the peaceful aftermath of our month-long struggle. After a while though, my wolf meets my eyes again. Bo? Yes, Amicus? I'm sorry. S sorry? For, for everything. For taking you from your planet, for involving you in Adastra politics, for acting as if I knew better. Even if it was part of the parents' plan, it doesn't make it right, and I'm sorry. Plan? Amicus lets out a small, tired laugh, shaking his head. <laughs> Again, I'll tell you later. Let's just be together for now. I nod in agreement, ignoring the clicks on my neck, clinging to my wolf, happy to be in this quiet corner of the universe, undisturbed by politics, mad emperors, or monolithic space entities. The following days are strange, to say the least. After what happened in the amphitheater, the Wolven population has seemingly taken a great interest in me. I guess I'm a sort of celebrity at this point. I got my first taste of this while lounging in the dining room, only half paying attention to the screens when I realize that it's a reenactment of the trial by combat between Amicus and Kato. 
My character, portrayed by a small wolf wearing a rather uncanny human mask, jumps in at the last second to plunge the dagger into Kato's back. He is then stabbed directly in the throat by Kato, instead of slashed, and stands there for several seconds, clutching his neck while Amicus tears out Kato's throat, then arrives just in time to catch me as he swoons back. I have to stop watching at this point. The memories of what happened are too fresh and traumatizing for me to see played out, even if it is terribly acted out. While it's nice to be liked by the general population, I can't help but feel it's for the wrong reasons. I'm definitely being portrayed as a noble savage of sorts, so in love with my master that I broke the rules to save him, or I just didn't understand the rules well enough to abide by them. Either way, it makes me feel kind of uncomfortable. Meanwhile, Amicus is kept busy, of course. The quiet moment I had with him in the archives is actually the last really long moment I had with him since. Almost immediately after, Amicus was whisked away to various ceremonies and meetings as everything becomes official. Amicus is the emperor now, and he seems to be taking it rather well, especially after the incredible events preceding it. His personality has always been silly and a bit immature, but after taking the throne, He's taking a persona of a cool, calm leader. It's a side of him that I've seen occasional flashes of, and while I'm happy to see him fitting his role so well, I can't help but feel a bit sad that he has to quash that playful, outgoing side of himself. I suppose it's one of those parts of having to grow up. I try to stay out of his way for now, knowing that he has so much to do, but on the second day after the trial, I'm told by Com that Amicus wants to speak with me. I open the door and immediately hear Virginia's voice, raised slightly in annoyance. No! Lux is the city in desperate need of funds right now! Lex is doing very well! Well, I'm sorry, but the names are rather similar, are they not? I meant Lux anyway. Even if you meant it that way, I can guarantee you the Triumvirates won't be pleased hearing you mistakenly refer to which city they are from. Alright, alright, calm down! I'll be sure to remember that. And don't yell at me in front of the Triumvirates, please. You'll only give my critics more weaponry if I'm seen allowing my sister to treat me in such a way. All the more reason not to make a mistake, then. The two seem to realize that I'm there finally, and cease their argument. Bo! We were just finishing our conversation! Were we? I'm going to drill you on all of this again on our flight to the city. Virginia makes her way past me, pausing to rest upon my shoulder. Maybe I should put you in charge of my brother's studies. At least he listens to you. The she-wolf rolls her eyes before disappearing through the door, leaving us in silence so that Amicus' big, heavy sigh seems to resonate through the entire room. Ugh, God, she's relentless. Isn't that a good thing? I suppose, but it doesn't make it easier to deal with. Amicus is walking towards me and immediately takes me up in a deep hug, followed by a kiss. I kiss back feeling Amicus' tense body relax against mine, and I feel happy at the idea that I might be able to relieve his stress so easily. He finally draws back, smiling as he does. How have you been? I know we've been rather absent lately, but... I know, official business and everything. I've been okay, just trying to adjust to all the new. I sweep a hand around me, then hesitantly bring it to my neck, the wound that the parents had somehow healed, my trachea and vocal cords having been replaced and repaired with... something. I try not to think about it, and I got used to it for the most part. Well, I hope you've been adjusting smoothly then. Amicus brushes a paw through my hair, looking me over. What was it you wanted to talk about? Amicus pulls his paw back, and the look on his face starts to worry me. Is it about what happened with the parents? At this point in time, I know that something involving me happened while I'd been unconscious. For whatever reason, I'd be kept unaware of the conversation that happened between Amicus and the parents. Amicus nods, rubbing an arm awkwardly. Uh, yes, it's, it's rather complicated, so it may take a moment for me to explain it all. The wolf guides me to the sofa, and then we sit side by side as Amicus drapes an arm around my shoulder. Over the next few minutes, he tells me of the deal he made with the parents, that he submit himself to their will, if only to bring me back to life. It's a similar decision that I had to make, and I shake my head. I don't like that. Why are they doing this to us? Amicus shrugs loosely against me, shaking his head as well. I honestly don't know, but I can tell you that my view of them has changed quite a bit since what happened. 
So what? Now you have to do whatever I say or something bad is going to happen to me? Again, my hand drifts up to my neck, wondering if there's something more to the mechanics in my throat. An irrational part of my mind wonders if there's maybe some type of self-destruct mechanism built into it. I shudder at the thought of my throat suddenly exploding. I doubt that, but I feel that maybe they would make it difficult for us to stay together if they did. Our meeting together, it was planned by the parents. This was something that I sort of assumed on my own, but I still bristle nonetheless. See? They're using our love against us! This is... This is just fucked up! Amicus nods quietly, but draws me closer with his arm around my shoulder. So they just draw us together, and I was like, the most compatible human to you. So now they can make sure that we do as we're told so we can stay together? Again, Amicus is quiet, just holding me. So if your job is to bring the galaxia together, what is my job? Amicus takes another slow deep breath, which only spikes my anxiety. I realized that the release I felt in the archive room was only temporary. I suppose it was a bit silly that I thought that everything would be fine after Amicus became the Emperor. This is only the beginning. Well, this is what I wanted to talk to you about. I wait, feeling Amicus steal himself, and I feel my anxiety grow. How bad could this actually be? Then he lets out the breath with a rush of words, seemingly trying to get the explanation out all at once. Have your parents told me that your mission is to begin the process of integrating humans into the galaxies? I'm only starting to absorb that when Amicus takes another deep breath and starts another slew of words. They want you to return to Earth and complete a series of steps to begin the integration process, a process that will take... Amicus suddenly winces, as though the words themselves hurt. That will take about 8 years to complete. That last bit takes the longest for me to comprehend. Eight years? Eight years? Like, I'll have to go to Earth for eight years and do a bunch of crap to bring my planet to the galaxies? Amicus nods, and I see the deep sadness on his face. This explains why he wasn't exactly happy after we had escaped the parental dimensions. I find myself at a loss of words, even though there's so much I want to ask. Amicus tries to fill the silence. Your planet won't be... conquered or anything. Rather, you're already on a sibling level like. You're unique in that way that you aren't exactly a sibling species, but you won't be under the control of another civilization, if that makes sense. A aside from their parents, of course. That's a relief, I suppose. Though, the more I learn about the parents, the more I'm unsure of any about this. While I'd once worried about the walls evading Earth, I'm not sure I want the parents to be doing the same. At least they are very hands-off, I guess. And the eight years? Will I just... Will I be able to see you? I see the corner of Amicus' muscle dip down deeply in a frown before stubbornly pulling it back up, the way he often did when he was trying not to tear up. No, but I discussed with them those supplements that we take to extend our lifetimes. You'll be able to take them to make those eight years seem more negligible. The way Amicus is talking, Fast pace and upbeat tells me that he's trying to make this sound like it isn't a huge deal at all. But it is. Eight years? The arm around my shoulder brings me into a full-on hug now, pressing my face against his chest. I know, it, it seems like a long time, and, and it is. But after that, we'll be free. Amicus' voice is strained, like there's a heavy weight in his chest. We both know we won't. Am I gonna have to do all of that alone? C couldn't you come with me? Now I just sound childish. I can see Amicus' eyes glistening, but he stubbornly continues to smile. You won't need my help. You're fully capable on your own. Besides, we'll see each other again as soon as your series of planned steps are completed. Over the course of eight years. And once we reach that point, we'll be able to finally relax and enjoy our lives. I'm still trying to absorb the idea of a year-long mission, a mission that involves introducing all of Earth to the idea of sapient life beyond our planet. That idea is harrowing enough, but after being strung along by the parents like this, I have to wonder. It seems like after we accomplish every step, there's a bigger one right after. I feel my heart rate pick up, but rather than becoming angry, I'm feeling kind of desperate. 
How much are they gonna ask from us? This whole thing is just... Puppeteering! We're not in control of anything at all! Bo. Amicus reaches out to me as I stand up. Please, I know it's hard. I've been trying to figure out a way not to drag you into this, but the parents seem to intend to- This isn't fair though! We paid our dues! I fucking died! Again, I sound like a little kid. I can't help myself. This really isn't fair at all. I didn't ask for any of this. Originally, I had Amicus to blame. He was the one that brought me here in the first place. Now though, knowing that everything was planned and orchestrated by the parents, I feel powerless, like I didn't have any choice from the very beginning. I don't even have a say in this. What you do? I haven't gotten to that part yet. Amicus has his paws raised, and I can see that he's still trying to hold back tears. I want to lash out at something, but I know this isn't his fault, especially now, so I try to calm down, taking a few deep breaths and swallowing hard. They told me that you can make a decision, just as I made mine. I'm quiet for a moment, still breathing heavily. You can choose not to accept the mission. They will not force you to do it. We have about nine months until the mission begins. I stare at the wolf, letting those words sink in. And... and if I don't accept? What are the consequences? That deep frown returns on Amicus' face. Well... they won't provide transport back to Earth. Of course, I'll likely be able to set it up for you now, but considering that the integration will be delayed, I will be disallowed from returning to see you. So... so I either do as they say, or I'll never be able to see you again? Well, you could choose not to return to Earth. I'm not suggesting that to be your decision, but it is one of the possibilities. I look away, just feeling terrible. And the main reason for that is because I feel like I have to do this. Even though I know Amicus has his doubt about the parents now, I know he still believes in their end goal, and if I just give up on it all now... I, I need to think about this. I'm starting to turn away when Amicus abruptly stands up. I think he's going to come after me, maybe wrap me into another hug. Instead, he keeps his paw behind his back, looking at me with an expression of stoic duty. Alright, I'll be heading out to the city for the part of the day to visit with the triumvirate. And whatever you choose, Bo, I will fully support you. It takes me a moment to realize that Amicus is using his official face right now, and it's strange to have him use it on me. Even though I know he's doing it to make things easier for me, to not sway my decision based on his emotions, I hate that he has to do it. I shake my head and turn away, walking out of the room, even as I hear Amicus make a strangled noise as he cuts himself off as he holds back from saying whatever he was going to say. I walk briskly through the hallways, trying to gather my thoughts. I just want to spend time with Amicus, go back to Earth, see my family, and come back to Adastra. But no, these parents are meddling with my life, seemingly rendering every choice I make meaningless. If they can do all and see all, why are they messing with me and Amicus like this? I'm lost in thought as I turn a corner and run smack into something soft, furry, and white. Ugh! What in the name of the gods? It takes me a moment to recognize the voice, probably because how disoriented I am for running into him. Sorry, Cassius. I finally focus on the Digiant Wolf as he angrily smooths down his fur. Watch where you're going! You could have knocked me to the floor! You know what a catastrophe that could have resulted in! Despite his outrage, I'm actually kind of happy to see Cassius back to his old self. Just two days ago he was bedridden, though recovering. A combination of Virginia inducing him to vomit and a quick delivery of an antidote left Cassius in a position to fully recover. <laughs> Hello to you too, Cass. Cassius fixes me with a narrow eye glare. Since when did I give you permission to use my shortened name, human? I shrug, simply adjusting my robe after having it disheveled from the collision. How are you feeling? Changing the subject, I see. Well, never mind. I'm feeling fine, thank you. I can at least eat solid food now without retching, though I doubt I will ever be able to drink wine again without doing so. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sure you are. I shake my head, wondering why the wolf has to be so sour all the time. Maybe it's a side effect of always being second in line for everything. 
maybe it's also because of his illness, always seen as weak and needing to help, and he reacted by being a dick. Then again, it could also just be because he is a dick. So, um, so what are your plans now that now that I abdicated the throne and I'm leaving in disgrace? You're not leaving in disgrace. I think the people are going to be really... I'm already being made fun of for being one of the shortest serving emperors in the history of the empire. I'm the main topic of all the comedies at the moment. Ah. Cassius takes a deep breath, closing his eyes. Anyway, Bo, I wanted to thank you. I almost get whiplash from the sudden change of tone and topic. What? Oh, don't make me say it again. I'm simply thankful for you putting the Empire in a course that is uh, somewhat tolerable, at least. As opposed to being ruled by Kato? Yes. While I might not believe that my brother is what is best for the Empire, at least he cares for it, and I suppose that's all I can hope for. Weren't you negotiating a position with Amicus? Cassius looks at me suspiciously, though I have no idea why. I suppose almost being assassinated and also being sabotaged by everyone in the palace has made him a bit wary. <sighs> I suppose he'll tell you anyway. So yes, I'm looking to become the chief of social affairs. He rolls his eyes at my lack of reaction. In other words, I will be making sure that the Dastar's most vulnerable are taken care of, that all will someday receive the financial, social and especially medical care that they need. I perk up. Oh, good! That's kind of what you were talking about with your campaigning, right? Yes, it would be nice to focus my energy on that, rather than the bothersome politics that will come with being an emperor. I don't envy Amicus. He eyes me closely. I know you're very close to him, so please, if I must ask you anything, it's to make sure that he doesn't forget those outside of the Triumvir cities. Their situation is desperate, and if you are truly going to reap fortune from an alliance, then they should be the first to benefit, not the Adastran elites. It's one of those rare moments that Cassius is being completely genuine with me, so I nod earnestly. Of course! I also plan on making sure that Amicus remembered the Wolven children, and to right the wrongs of what their past rulers had done to them. There's a lull in the conversation, and I try to think of something to say, to thank Cassius for in return. And, um, thank you for understanding our position, and for deciding to step down when we asked. Well, you threatened me with outright humiliation if I didn't. I tried to hold in a sigh of my own at the wolf's frustrating attitude, even if my attempt at some sort of diplomacy with him was clumsy. Yeah, well, uh, thanks anyway. Cassius grunts non committically then looks past me. Anyway, I must be going to the city. I have an appointment. That's when I remember Alex. I never saw Cassius' reaction to finding out about the cat's treachery. Amicus had been furious when I told him, and I'd practically had to hold him back from marching out into the gardens and strangling the cat himself. He was especially furious when I told him that I made a deal with Alex to keep him from facing the consequences of sabotaging the entire empire. Amicus had settled on banishing Alexius from the palace to some high security apartment in the center of Adastra city, and Cassius has been visiting him there ever since. While I don't know what the state of their relationship is, I suppose even high treason isn't enough to stop Cassius from seeing the cat again. They must be pretty close, even closer than I initially thought. I'm curious, but I stop myself from asking, as I know that it would only lead to more glares and sneers from the wolf. So instead, I bow and step aside, a bit surprised when Cassius bows in return, even if it's mostly just a half-hearted nod. I watch the white wolf disappear through the main entrance and I wait a few moments before taking the same route out into the gardens. While the conversation with Cassius had distracted me for a bit, my mind wanders back to what Amicus had just told me. I can't stop the feeling of constriction that seemed to wrap around me, bound to the will of these supposed all-knowing creatures. I sit for a while on the bench, contemplating everything, while my head absently caresses my repaired neck. I'd pressed a bit harder against the skin a few times, and I didn't like the unfamiliar shapes and edges that I felt. I'd ask Amicus how the parents had done it, how they had the time to place the machinery in my neck, and also make me start breathing again. And of course, it turns out that it's one of those parental tech things that no one really understands. It seemed to have happened instantaneously, as if I had been whisked away somewhere else to have the surgery, before being placed back into the archives. Apparently, when Amicus' father had asked the parents to restore Kato's sight, it had just happened overnight, the old wolf surprising everyone when he walked out into the dining room with his new visor. And that had been over a decade ago. 
And that gets me wondering why the Paris did that if they knew that Carter would go on to do the things he did. He blatantly got in the way of the plans. Why would they let him hold such an influential position in the Empire? Hi, Bo. Please include this in your edits that I'm disturbing you. Hello to all your fans. This is Casey. <laughs> Why would they let him hold such an influential position in the Empire, let alone restore his vision? Interference is to be kept a minimum, I can particularly hear the Monitor say. I sigh, just wishing that the parents didn't exist at all. That this other wasn't eating the edges of our universe, which apparently is the root cause to all of this. And that's something else I don't understand. From what I gathered, the Galaxies had already known about the other, but vaguely. And because I'd almost described it to me when we first arrived here, and had been told that all life originated from the same source. Except for the other. A different type of life. So different from us that we can barely understand them. But now we know that they're out to get us or something. I just can't help but feel so distant from all of this. The result of the struggle between us and them being millennia away. We don't even know how many millennia. As I'm becoming more and more depressed over all of this. I hear footsteps on the path. I look up, half expecting to see Alex, even as I remember that he's banished from the palace. It's a pharaoh, and he's strolling along the pathway, with his usual suave smile plastered on his muscle. I have to wonder how he keeps that expression on all the time, as it's clear he doesn't see me until he comes a bit closer. When he does spot me, his ears flick up, and I get a glimpse of white teeth as his smile broadens. I smile back, even though I'm not in the best mood to chat at the moment. Still, I scoot over to make room on the bench, and the pharaoh greets me with a bow along with an out tap be with you, before he sits next to me, crossing one leg over the other. Beautiful day. He says it wistfully, and I just nod in agreement. Though I can see that you are not enjoying it as much as I am. Is everything alright, Bo? I'm about to give him a generic answer, before I sigh, leaning back on the bench. No, no, not really, the pharaoh. Ah, I find that a bit surprising, considering the way things have gone the past few days. I mean, aside from almost dying, I guess everything here is good. But up there? I nod up at the sky. At space. I just don't know what to do. Perhaps I could offer some advice? Uh... I remember that Amicus had told me to keep the revelations about human civilization a secret. At least until the parents give further instructions. I, I don't know, I think I'm just stressed out about going home. About how I'm gonna do it, you know? Uh, I definitely understand, for I am in a similar boat. Unfortunately, I have very little advice on that particular matter. I glance over at him, watching as he rhythmically bounces a black foot about, wigging the toes and claws. Is Kimia still pissed about what happened? Oh yes, furious. They're still threatening to cut all diplomatic relations with Adastra if Amicus doesn't make things right somehow. Make things right? Yes, despite the fact that my family very nearly despises me, they actually despise that our name has been sullied by Wolven disrespect. Like how you were almost executed? That, and also the fact that Dakota released the footage of his attack on my person before the scheduled execution. It's been in heavy rotation on the news channels ever since. Oh. I haven't watched Matadas on TV after seeing the reenactment of my own death, so I guess I've been missing the pharaoh getting kicked in the balls over and over again. Um, well, you know the wolves. They're just like any sort of drama. It's been spread across the entire galaxies. I suppose being a Kimian in such a position is rather amusing to everyone, siblings and children alike. I look over at Nefer again, but his light, carefree demeanor continues as he simply seems to be soaking in the scenery. Are you doing alright? Nefer looks at me then, smile becoming a bit more warm. I am fine, Bo, but if I'm being truthful, I am embarrassed, but that's nothing new for me. I frown. I can count the number of times you've been embarrassed on one hand, Nefero. You're downright shameless! I smile to lighten the word, and Nefero just chuckles. You probably know at this point that I'm not often genuine. It comes from being a diplomat and the pharaoh's son. There's a lull in the conversation as we both just watch the gardens, listening to the birds and watching the bees hover from flower to flower. And that's when I'm reminded of something. So, what made the Kimias want to start an alliance? Isn't it pretty groundbreaking for siblings to work together? Like, isn't that against the purpose of the Galaxias? I play dumb, like I don't already know it isn't. Nefero quirks an eyebrow at me. That is a surprising question. Well, to put it simply, 
We studied the earliest histories of the galaxies and came to the conclusion that it was never the intent of the parents for us to be competitors. If you don't know, the goal of a sibling race and its children is to achieve parental status. And to do that, we must be able to achieve intergalactic travel. We are uh, slowly realizing that this may not be possible without the cooperation of all sapient life in the galaxy. I think I might actually might have been underestimating how smart the Chemians actually are, if they figure that out. I mean, what happened since the parents created everything like many, many millennia ago. Also, yeah, I'm wearing a new shirt because this is the third day I'm recording this episode because I had to uh, record it in parts. Yeah. I nod in understanding. So it seems that the Chemians were already hip on this grand plan, either by actually figuring it out themselves or with the help of their own parent. This makes me wonder if they know more about the thing lingering on the edge of the universe. Do you know much about the other? Now Nefer returns on the bench to really look at me, furrowing his brows. Another interesting question. Did you have some sort of experience with the parents when they healed your wounds? Uh, yeah, kind of. Just really vague stuff. So I'm just curious about it is all. I try to make it sound like it's not a big deal. Hmm. Well, it is an, um, entity that spreads through the universe every few billion years. It originated from somewhere other than the original source of life, the source from which we all came. His choice of words is confusing me. Is it like... alive? Is it alive like you and I? No, not really. It's more of a... machine, I suppose. On the edge of life, but it needs sapient life to exist. Oh, like a virus? Yes, actually. Though even viruses originated from the original source, the other is truly something different. And it feeds on life? Our life, I mean? First, I should say that all we know about it is very little, very limited, and the majority of that information is likely wrong. Really just ghost stories. Well, what are these ghost stories? Nefero sighs, and I realize that he's not really interested in this topic. How to put it? Uh, well... It's thought that in the half dozen or so times that the other has spread through our part of the universe, it has left behind small patchy portions of itself. It's uh, technically all around us, but very weak, though it is thought that a highly concentrated portion of it attached to tangible things or occasionally patched through us. Is it supposed to be like dark matter or something, maybe? I feel a little tingle down my spine. And what does it do? Neferi shakes his head. I'm sure your people have stories of phenomena that are unexplained. Perhaps an abandoned building that is inhabited by a malicious spirit? Possibly a creature that defines all logical explanation, yet sporadically appears in a particular forest? Wait, like supernatural stuff? I give the jackal an incredulous look, and he shrugs and laughs. So the stories say. They also say that the sapient's consciousness is used by the other to project these manifestations, and that the sapient's reactions to these projections feeds the entity. Personally, I feel that the legends around the others are simply a catch-all for anything that is feared, or poorly understood, or just the production of a bored society. I think back to what little I know about ghosts, monsters, and even aliens or UFOs, and immediately the idea is too ridiculous for me to accept. Why haven't I heard about this while I've been here? You probably have, just didn't understand the topic at the time. Either way, it's never serious to worry about anyone's mind, considering how rarely this entity makes contact with our side of the universe. I just stare at the ground, not really sure what to say. Like Neferu, I find myself not very interested in the topic anymore, and our discussion moves on. We talk of Neferu's plans, when we might return home, and how I might be able to secure the Alliance. Eventually, he gets up to return to his room for a nap, leaving me to sit on the bench in silence. If I'm being honest, the conversation has left me feeling a bit strange about the whole intergalactic war the parents are preparing for. It sounds more like we're getting ready to fight off an army of space ghosts rather than anything real. I sit there for a long while, opening my mind a bit, kind of hoping that the monitor will swing by and dump a little more information on me that I can work with, even though I know it's not really in his nature. The problem is that I already know that I'll probably do this mission. In the end, uh, I kind of feel like I have to trust his parents, despite how awful they are being to me and Amicus. It's for the good of all sapiens, right? And if it isn't, 
well, I don't want to imagine we're doomed at the hands of some manical space gods. Things stay predictably quiet, and as I'm thinking about heading back to Amicus's room to see if he has returned, Com's voice makes me jump. Amicus would like you to know that he is currently in the bath, and if you would like to, you can join him. However, he wants to make it explicitly clear that it's your choice, and if you need more time, thanks Com, I'll head there now. Yes, Bo. I immediately spot Amicus as the door slides open, and I see the wolf jolt from leaning back against the edge of the pool before quickly leaning back again, raising a paw casually. I walk through the steamy air to stand behind Amicus, next to the bench, and he looks back at me with a gentle smile. Soak with me? I nod wordlessly and slip out of my robes and underwear before walking to the edge of the pool. With a little hop, I dip in quietly all at once, mostly used to the scalding temperature at this point. As I come up, Amicus reaches out to me and I press up next to him, fitting against the curve of his chest in my familiar, easy way. So, how was the meeting with the Triumvirates? Good, good, mostly seeming pointless talk and etiquette, but as you and I know, it's necessary. As long as there aren't any riots. Yes, as long as there aren't any of those. We sit in the hot water for a while, and I enjoy the way it makes my worry seem so far away, locked behind the doors to the bath. I should do this more often. But, of course, it's the main thing on Amicus' mind right now. He clears his throat nervously. Um, did you think about... Um, I mean, did you make your decision... No, s sorry. Amicus trails off in the most awkward way possible, and I laugh a little bit, though it's more of a sad laugh. A little, but... Uh, I don't think I have a choice. That any of us really have a choice. That's not true. You can choose... This is all meant to happen. It's the entire reason that any of this happened at all. I have a purpose, and... Uh, I don't know... I don't really want to cause delays, especially if it will help your empire in the end. Amicus grumbles. Well, I don't believe that you should be forced to take on duties that were thrust upon you without your consent. It's cruel, and I want you to choose what you feel is right. I give Amicus a look. Hasn't that been your whole life? Well, yes, but I'm talking about you. I smirk. Oh, I see. The big dumb ape who can't handle big boy responsibilities. Amicus' reaction to my teasing is instant and visceral. No, I would never! <laughs> Sorry, I was kidding. I shouldn't make fun about that. Amicus sets us back again, still looking concerned. It's alright. I, I just don't want you to ever feel that way again. Amicus sighs deeply. <sighs> also, I do believe that we would have met somehow, even without the parents intervening. Now I really give Amicus a look. Seriously? <laughs> of course, something this special can't be stopped by the likes of time and space. Amicus starts pulling me into his body, nuzzling me. Anyway, I'm not completely sure yet. I need more time to think about it, and we do have nine months. Take your time, but if you do choose to go, you must promise me one thing. I feel a little apprehension at that. Yes? Well, eight years is quite a while for a human lifespan, so I know you rejected them initially, but please start taking the life extension medication. There's a formula especially for primates. I need you around for as long as I am, Bo. I realize then how well Amicus has taken this whole eight year thing, and I have to wonder if he's trying to make it sound less bad than it actually is. Eight years is a long time, whether you're a human or a wolf. I'd actually forgotten about the lifespan extending medication after Amicus had told me about it. For whatever reason, extending my life by decades, even hundreds of years, didn't really appeal to me at the time. But now, all I want is more time. So I nod. Of course. And that's where we end for today. Uh, as I said, I had to re record this episode over three days, um, but now this episode is finished and I hope I can get it up to the weekend, as usual. Um, but yeah, the, the other, it sounds so cool I, and scary at the same time. Um, I love how they do the whole thing that there's much more going on outside of the story and the world than we can really know about much. Which leaves a lot of room for other games. Um, like Chemia and Intera, 
and maybe other future games. So very exciting about that. And very excited by the next episode to see what happens next. You will find out in a week, I hope. Anyways, share share this playlist with your friends. If you if you have friends who don't know what Adastra is, if they enjoy these kind of stories, that would be much appreciated. Anyways, I love you guys. So take care and remember that you are loved and appreciated and that you should be proud of who you are because I want to see you in the next episode. Bye! Oh, that's not the camera, that's... Honestly, this shirt doesn't look good at all. I actually think I bought a size too big. Damn.